So today, what are we going to talk about? How and why rocks are, right? Well, I'm trying to think more like my audience, so I changed the title to why the we're at a high school too, so I'm going to watch my mouth. <laughs> why the heck would I swap my athletes the same way your big fat powerlifting ass does? Um, I don't want my athletes to look like you. I understand that. Okay. Um, I'm just going to go over some things we did and why I think it helped our athletes and can help yours too. Um, take the powerlifting thing out of it. Okay. Um, I've been powerlifting now for about 10 years, and I've never seen one of these at a meet where people get to sit on it and then stand up. It's all free squatting, right? So that's kind of a knock on what I do, not what I do, this kind of system, is there's like a powerlifting stigma. But if we really think about that, powerlifting is squat, bench, and deadlift, right? So if we run this system the correct way, we're really only going to do those three lifts maybe once or twice a year. Whereas a lot of other popular programs that are out there right now do those on a weekly basis, at least once. So whose program is more like a powerlifting, okay? This, the method that this was stolen from was designed in Russia to train a multiple sport Olympic athletes, okay? So just kind of, this is just a tool. Nate talked about it earlier, like, we're kind of on different sides of the coin. I don't think so. I, th I think, and it, this is true with a lot of programming, we're a lot closer than what it looks like from the outside. You know what I mean? Like we used to do a lot of single leg stuff. Um, I never got as advanced as you did, but I think there's a lot of crossover. So just try to think of this as an easy exercise to teach your athletes and they can recover from it. Okay? Try to get that powerlifting, that <coughs> bad word, that bad powerlifting word out of our head, okay? <laughs> um, this is a, a room I got to build when I was coaching. Um, to me, confidence, this is the biggest thing you can give your kids in this room, right? There's no, any of you guys that compete and train, you know there's no better feeling when you go out on game day and feel like a superhero, right? But you have to earn that. It doesn't just happen. So we got guys like Chad and all these people sitting here helping younger athletes in this room. That's the best thing you can do for them, okay? I believe in that so much that I spent six grand on that freaking sign. <laughs> <laughs> you wanna know why New York State's broke? Okay, <laughs> not my fault. To build this sign, we had to build the wall out a little bit. So I'm thinking, me and my assistants will go to Home Depot, get some two by fours, build the wall out for 500 bucks. No, 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 no. We have to bring the university uh, steel workers in to build I-beam frames on the wall, which put our costs up to like five grand. But I didn't care because I had to be there, okay? Um, so I want you guys to know anything I talk about today too. I'm not trying to be cocky, I'm just coming from a place of conviction. Um, as sad as this may be, this training stuff, or lifting, has been a huge part of my life for the last 28 years. The conjugate stuff has been the last 20 years, so um, anything I say, please know it's not just some certification I picked up or whatever, all right? Um, same thing like with the equipment that I sell. When I had a hundred grand uh, blank check, guess where I went shopping? Because I knew that all this stuff was designed by people who actually train and know this stuff, okay? So that's our room, like I said. Best room in the country, in my opinion. All right, this is me at 14-ish years old, all right? Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> my point is, I started training when I was 12, okay? At 14, my dad kind of saw where my interests were going, because at that time, like, Anything else that I was into took a backseat to training, right? Training in sports. Um, and he told me, there's a, there's a profession like called a strength coach. You go in and work with athletes and help them get better and it's a thing. So it was basically, like at that point, that's what I was gonna do. I knew I was gonna coach, right? So, still training, um, played high school football. Was lucky enough to go play football at Rockport, actually. The guy that, the guy that called me to recruit me is sitting over there, so that's pretty neat, right? <laughs> here's a quick story. So, as a, and here's kind of messed up too, right? So, like, where I grew up, I was like the only dude that lifted. Like, people were like, what are you doing? Why would you do that? I even had a family member. Basketball was very popular, which I sucked at basketball. I had, a, I had an uncle who's like, I don't know why he's lifting all those weights. He's ruining his athletic ability, right? So, some of my buddies, they're starting to get recruited for basketball. And I haven't gotten any calls yet, so I'm starting to get pissed off. Like, I'm busting my ass, and these guys just go play basketball, and they're getting recruited. 
So we come home after a game one night. There's two messages on the voice. On the voice, we had the actual. <laughs> what do they call that thing? Answering machine. Answering machine. Answering machine. <laughs> I was going to say voicemail, but that's not right. So the, the lights blinking or whatever. And I had a terrible game. We had a basketball game. I played like, like usual. So I go over and listen. There's Coach Ricky on there. Hey, we want you to come up, take a visit to Brockport. So I was like, F all you guys. <laughs> <laughs> now the listen's paying off. What's up, you know? So, sorry. Back to my story. <laughs> so I wanted to be a straight coach. Went through undergrad. We didn't really have a coach. Um, it was kind of put the paper out and go do the workout, made a sign in type thing, which is very common in, in Division Three, right? Um, went through undergrad. Before my senior year, I stumbled onto the conjugate method and kind of this type of training. Um, did it before my senior year. Senior year, I felt great, felt strong, felt recovered. Um, so that was kind of where I knew. I was onto something, right? I've never felt that good. So, uh, finished up undergrad, went to grad school, and it was about, so right before my senior year, I kind of found a lead FTS. Dave put an article out on the conjugate method, and that's how I stumbled onto it, okay? So, started like 99, 2000. I'm on the website all the time, just reading all sorts of stuff. Um, got out for a little bit, we were back home, kind of pursued the teaching thing, too many damn teachers. I want to go coach. 05, we came up to Buffalo and I started my grad work. Um, finished that up around 07. Yep, finished up grad work around 07, started volunteering at UB. Was able to hang on there for 10 years, which in the coaching world is pretty good. Um, so that kind of ended. Um, but my point of that long ass story was for me to achieve that kind of lifetime goal, there was five big factors that let me do that. Like, my wife was on board, we moved to Buffalo, bought a house we could barely afford. She said, go to grad school, you know, did all that stuff. Parents always backed me up for the most part, except when I told mom that I didn't want to teach, I wanted to go coach, because she was a kindergarten teacher. So, the fact that she still talks to me after that conversation, <laughs> I gotta give her props for. Um, but these last three, like, the really good people that I've been around, the knowledge from this, from the site, helped get me there. So it kind of come around full circle, and, yeah, on board and very cool. I always have to talk about that. So, this is uh, one of my favorite quotes. This hung above my desk my whole time coaching. Um, if you want science and studies, F you, I've got blood and scars and vomit. And that's Jim Wendler's quote. Okay? Um, not that research isn't important, not that we don't need it to later validate what we're doing, but you guys all know this. You guys figure things out in the weight room and training here. It's not gonna be studied or come out in PubMed or whatever for another 15, 20 years, okay? So, my point is, a lot of the stuff that I talk about, you can't go find in a research journal. It's, that's just the way it is. It's so delayed, it doesn't happen like that. Um, like I remember early 2000s, like when chains and stuff were starting to get popular, um, there was a study in an SEA journal so I was like, cool, man, people are, this is starting to gain some momentum and people are getting on, on board with it. And then I read the study, and you go to the methods section in the back and they set the stuff up wrong. You know what I mean? So there's always, there's always that. So, okay. Why are we in a box squat wide, right? People, that, that was one thing I run into doing this. If you're gonna box squat correctly, your feet are typically gonna be out wider than a normal pre-squat, than what we normally see in a training setting. Okay. This is one reason. How many times on the field do we get with our feet outside of our shoulder width? Okay. Even if it's not in this exact spot, I might be here, right? This could be bad. Like I'm getting outside of that radius. So it only makes sense to me to have some strength there. You know what I mean? So you always deal with that. Now, with that, when you're teaching this, you're going to teach them to be proficient out wide but you're not gonna squat out there all the time. So once you get them good at this, you're gonna alternate like every other week on your heavy days, or max effort days, however you wanna term it, okay? <laughs> like every other week or every third week, you're gonna go into a close stance. Because if you're out here all the time, you're gonna beat your hips up, okay? Now on our speed days, we're gonna stay out here 99% of the time. Okay, that's one kind of misconception, I think. People think we're gonna squat out here all the time. That's not it, okay? We wanna be strong everywhere. 
All right? Now, typically a wide stance squat will build strength in close. Squatting in close all the time will not build you out here, okay? If you're here, all, if you train here all the time and then come out wide or get in a weird position on the field, you will get your ass kicked, okay? Another reason I think this works well, again, this is my experience, kind of like Nate said earlier. This is my experience. This is not proven, but at some point, yeah. is it a coincidence? No. So, another reason we do this, it's easier to recover from. Okay? When you squat to a box and you do it properly, all this stuff I say is box squatting properly, okay? It's easier to recover from. We work with athletes, right? They have to go to practice. Someone might have jobs. They got all this stuff they got to deal with the rest of the week. Outside of the weight room, let's help them out a little bit, right? Why do people take steroids? Recover. Recover. Recover, so why not build some of that into our training, right? The box squats, not the steroids. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're um, so we can recover quicker, right? Go into any weight room on heavy squat day, and what are you going to hear? Lower, lower, you're almost there. Come on, get down. If you set your box up right, almost every rep is the proper depth, okay? There's an argument we don't need to squat to parallel because we're not power lifters. I completely agree. But if I want a muscle to contract maximally, it has to be stretched optimally. So you have to get some depth there. Does that make sense? So I need to sit, I need to get down a little bit. Everybody talks about glutes and hamstrings. If I'm gonna get those, I'm gonna get down there a little bit, okay? So with the box there, it kind of gives, it simplifies things. Way easier to teach. We would typically have 75% of the room or so squatting with pretty decent technique on day one. Okay? And we'll talk about how we progress that later, but it's easier to teach. Your kids are there to be good at sports. They're not concerned with how much they squat so much. Right? Like I said, this is just a tool to help them get stronger and increase their power on the club. Okay? Um, Typically, when I had athletes come over from a free squatting dominant program, and we put them on box squats, this was like Groundhog's Day, by the way. Within a couple weeks, the kids with knee problems would start to say, oh my knees aren't bothering me so much, I feel pretty good. A couple weeks after that, the athletic trainers would say, not sure what you're doing, but the kids seem to feel better. We're seeing less and less of them. And the reason for that is, and you'll see this later, you can get back in the hips more. Right, again, we're going back to glutes and hamstrings. If I'm squatting and my knees are shifting forward, where's that load going? Right there, into my quads and knees, okay? If I can keep a perpendicular shin angle, it stays back in my glutes and hamstrings. Now, we would go knee forward, like on our single leg stuff, like you were talking about, you know what I mean? Because, like, you want to be strong everywhere, right? So, like I said, this isn't the only thing you're going to do. This is just one movement, okay? Um, so, we saw knees feel better, we saw backs feel better. Uh, the, the reason for the backs is, again, this is theory. Uh, I think most of, the, most of the people we see are very weak in the grand scheme of things. So for them to sit back in a free squat and actually use their glutes is very hard. Because I think what happens is the psoas start grabbing on to stabilize the spine. Because I know when my back hurts, this, this, is, this gets tight, right? So I think that's what happens with free squatting. With this, they can get back where they need to be and get, get back in the, in the hips more, okay? It kind of simplifies the movement. Um, <coughs> we're developing change of direction skill, okay? You'll see this when we go over this later. If you box squat correctly, when I go to stand up off the box, I'm not standing up, I'm not pushing down. I'm here and I'm driving out on my feet. Okay, so what is that the same of? The same as change of direction. I'm pushing out the side. We um, we hardly ever trained agility unless a coach like demanded it or whatever. Um, and our agility scores, for the most part, continue to improve. And I think I think that's why. Um, I had in the ten years I was there, with the teams that worked directly underneath me, I had one ACL tear in 10 years. And I think this is a large reason why for that. That's a big part of it. The other piece would be 
the amount of hip and hamstring work that we did, I think. So in training, when I have 500 pounds on my back, I'm gonna to try to keep the load off of my knees. I'm gonna load my knees on the field. I completely get that. But on our, on our big, most taxing movement, I think it's good to get back in your hips and stay off your knees. I think that was a big reason why the injury rates are so low. How do we teach this and get the kids to lifting heavy weights with us, okay? So when you teach this, and when we go do the practical, like I'm just gonna to explain to you guys like you're a group of athletes in the room, and then we'll go off and you guys can squat, okay? We started at one, right? Yeah. Um, so our first two to three weeks, when you introduce this, is just gonna be light speed work, okay? So what you do is, we'll take you up on the rack, show you what we want, show you how to do it, and then you go to your rack, do the bar for 15 to 20 reps to warm up, and then we're gonna put weight on, light weight. Okay, and we're gonna start doing sets of two. So as soon as we get weight on the bar, it's just sets of two. So it's like a speed workout or a dynamic effort workout. You're gonna stay at that weight until the coach comes around and tells you to add weight. So let's say you guys are, um, let's go with like the women's swimming. Okay, day one, everyone's gonna go, hit your bar for 15 reps. Your first set of two is gonna be a 10 on each side, okay? Go around, everybody's hitting sets of two, so we got four guys on a rack, you guys are rotating through, sets of two with a 10 pound plate, I'll come over and I'll start adjusting the weight. And what I'm looking for is a weight that they have to push on a little bit, but still have some snap off the box, like that first video we watched, okay? So day one, that's all I'm doing. I'm going around helping them set weights, and they're just gonna do sets of two, they might do sets of two for 20, 30 minutes, okay? Your, your indicator is when like 75% of the room has it, it looks pretty decent, then you can stop squatting and you have all your weights set. Okay, does that make sense? So like, go around, this girl has a 10 on each side and that's heavy enough, right? She's having to push, still a little bit of snap on the bar, she's good. She knows that 65 pounds is her weight for the next two to three weeks. Because all we're gonna do is speed work. If we're squatting twice a week, both days are gonna be speed. Okay, so day one, I'm kind of setting that speed weight. And then, like, others are going to be stronger. So, like, this girl might have two tens on each side. One girl might have a 25 and a 10. But the point is, you just kind of work them up kind of slow and watch where they're at and then kind of set their weights. Train speed for two to three weeks. Um, usually, at that point, they're kind of ready to go. Things are looking technically very good. Not very good. It's, not, it's, it's never very good. But good enough to move forward. They, they know the positions. Um, they practice moving the bar fast for a few weeks. We're getting a training effect. Now we can start creeping the weight up. And usually what I did at that point was just use like an RPE system. Um, so instead of doing like a a two rep max, a three or five rep max, at that point I'd usually just say, okay, today you're going to do your warm up, and let's say we're going to do threes, we're going to do heavy threes. You guys are just going to work up doing sets of three until it feels like an eight out of ten. Okay, I want you to push kind of hard on the bar, but like if I had a gun to your head, you could probably do two or three more reps. All right, and that's it for the day, and then you go on to your accessories. Because most of the people that we work with are so untrained, we don't have to go crazy with the weights, right? Like when I was coaching, I didn't care what their squat was. I don't care, who cares? I want them to be, but that's not to say we're not gonna lift heavy stuff. They're gonna come in on max effort day, we're gonna challenge them, they're gonna go hard and then we get out. The max, the numbers really don't matter. So, we're working, just working up to RPE at that point. And then over the next couple weeks as they get better, then we'll start doing like a two rep max, three rep max. Usually at that point we can start hitting singles. Okay, uh, I do like to do singles if you can. If the group is technically proficient enough, I think there's a lot of benefits to true max effort training that we're not gonna get from other methods, okay? But it, you're not always gonna get your groups there. And that's okay. If they come in and they're only good for heavy set of five and then accessory work, they're still gonna get better. They're still gonna get stronger, okay? Um, I like to use accommodating resistance as soon as they're proficient at the movement. So usually about week two, all right? But you have to scale it. So like for a women's swim team, like I was saying, I'm gonna have mini bands on the bar, not the gray average bands, not the great big ones, okay? With the accommodating resistance, my thought on that is, 
why do I want to wait to help to teach them to accelerate or follow through or finish a rep or finish a tackle or finish a double leg shoot, right? Chains of bands will teach you to finish through. So why, why not put that on them as soon as they're proficient enough in the movement? Okay, but you gotta scale it, okay? And then like I said before, usually after about four to six weeks, they're pretty good. Then we'll start switching the stances on our heavier max effort day, okay? Percentages, everybody gets caught up on percentages. Who cares? We don't need to know their max. You don't need to use an exact percentage on speed day. It has to be a submaximal load and move it really fast, okay? Teach, teach them to accelerate the bar and push it as fast as they can and you're gonna be ahead of most people. Okay, because I see a lot of, like, just watch people lift. You don't see a lot of athletes with pop into the bar and acceleration, okay? Push as hard and fast as you can, right? Um, sets and reps. So the traditional is eight by two. The reason for that is Louis stole data they collected on the old Russian weightlifters. What um, the maximal sets, the optimal sets and reps were. Okay. So and then what he did was he figured out that two reps was the same amount of time it took for a competition squat. So this is just based off of powerlifting specific times. So if you have a sport where you think a five rep is gonna be better, that's fine. Just keep them moving the, the weight fast for whatever amount of time you determine is what they need. But the thing is, you don't wanna to go too long because we don't want lactic acid to start creeping in, right? So I don't wanna go, I really don't wanna go like eight, 10, 12 reps. We're trying to stay out of the lactic acid. We are trying to go to fatigue. When you do speed work, your rest period should be short, like 30, 45 seconds, okay? As I go into my next set, I should be a little bit fatigued. Because what happens is then you have to draw more fibers, right? Just like the French contrast stuff that's popular, it's the same concept. You're doing explosive work in a slightly fatigued state to get more fibers. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. Eh. So as we went along and we got better at this, we started to do some event specific um, times on this. So like, we would have situations where a 200 meter runner would speed squat for 20 seconds straight, as many reps as they could. We did it on a bell squat, I think that's better, but you can use a bar too. Um, our 800 meter runners went for two minutes. Dong. Yeah, that sucks. That sucks. But, <laughs> but the feedback was, you know, my race feels easy now, right? So who wins the race is the person that slows down the least. So after doing that, and we used that sparingly. That was only going into conference when we needed to peak. All right? Okay, any questions? All right, let's go. I got those three racks set up. So let's go over there, like on the GHRs. And then uh, we'll get, we'll put you guys up. Back and open till I'm on the box. Push out, drop my shoulders, stand up. Okay, what you're gonna see is they're gonna do this. And they're gonna rock back, and then they're gonna try to roll forward into it. Don't do that. Lean, push up, drive back. See how there's no forward movement? If you look at me from the side, the bar is gonna go straight up and down. Okay? So we got the lower half coached up now. With their hands, let them go where they're comfortable. Okay? Um, the big thing is that their hands are even. And I know this sounds stupid, like why in the hell are you saying this? Because they will mess it up. Make sure your hands are even on the bar. Use the rings, the smooth part, whatever, so that when you get under the bar, you're right in the center, okay? As you step under the bar, pinch your shoulder blades and give yourself a double chin, right? Lock from here to here in. Crank it in, okay? Right now, your biggest concern is lower body, okay? So, I have really good shoulders, so my hands are out here. <laughs> <laughs> the next thing is get your feet and your ass under the bar. Don't be here. Okay? So I'm under, look up a little bit, and then as they're doing this, you're going to coach them through everything. So if I'm coaching somebody through, stand up strong, step, step, that's all the steps I take. Look up a little bit, fill your belly, squat. Okay? Pause. Fast, okay? That's it. Okay, um, if 
you want to go through, we'll squat a little bit. Let's go bar from 10 to 15. I'm not stupid, I know you're not going to do 20. Um, and then we'll put a little bit of weight on it. Like some of you can put 25 on. We'll start doing sets of two and kind of push through. So, do like two more. His knees are kind of getting sucked in as he sits. I don't know if it's his jeans. Force your knees out really hard. Open. There. Good. That was better. Okay? You really got to open. And a lot of, so, what? Yeah, <laughs> Exactly. What do you coach say? My, my kids' hips are tight. They can't open up. This will, it'll help build in mobility at the same time. Let's go big orange. Open. Look at that. Lean. Open and lean, open and lean. Did you see how he flopped on that first rep? If your kids are dropping to the box, they're probably not leaning forward enough. Okay, so it's, they're trying to stay vertical and you can't hold that position, so it's lean. Let them lean in. Good. Good time. Go back. So if your kids' hips aren't getting back far enough, what you probably need to tell them to do is push the hips back first. And usually that'll get them in the right path. There you go. Back and open. Pause on it. Pause fast. There you go. We want them to pause on it. They're already good at stretch reflex, right? So if we sit and make them jump, go from a dead stop to as fast as they can, it's going to help them become more explosive and stronger. Okay. How do you feel about the box placement for that? To help with the hips going back? It's like a it's a to reach back more. Yeah, so it's a good idea. It it's a good idea. So make sure it's make sure they're not right over top of the box. Right. Put the box behind them a little bit so they gotta kind of reach for it. Yeah. Something that's very common is watch my knees. They'll sit over and over and over and their knees still out in front of their ankle. Okay, the best thing to do is just have them sit on the box, and I can have the bar on my back right now too. Keep their foot there and scoot them back. Scoot them back until their shin's perpendicular. And then push them forward here and let them feel that. Okay, as they're sitting there, tell them, push out on your feet, force your knees up hard, and it'll start to burn all through here. Lean forward. And then you can tell them to stand up. A lot of times, if they're not hitting a position, they just don't understand it. So that's what's cool about the box, too. Like, you can set them there, help them feel kind of like an isometric. You can set them there and they can feel it, and then they'll usually, that will fix them. What will happen is, that kid, once you start to load them up with weight a little bit, they'll revert back to the knees coming out because they're just trying to survive. They're trying to get through it. But that will usually fix them and they've at least seen that and felt it. Okay. 